So we've heard this morning about single molecule studies. Uh, and I'd like to tell you today about single molecule studies for magnetism. Um, we're not going to be talking about individual molecules, but we're going to be trying to extract properties of individual mo molecules. They're magnetic properties. So there's some relation between this talk and, and the last one. Um, so in this series, this, this talk is about uh, quantum spin dynamics, or how quantum fluctuations affect the properties of very small magnets. So in the last uh, lecture, you saw mostly about what we call, we call classical uh, micromagnetics, uh, where you can describe the dynamics in terms of the classical equations of motion. And today, we're going to talk about magnets where you really have to have a quantum description of the uh, system in order to understand the, the, the dynamics. So I'm going to tell you about quantum tunneling of the magnetization, um, what it is, and I'll tell you some of the initial discoveries, and some of the materials that, that are highlighting this physics, where you can really examine this physics in, in great detail. These are the materials called single molecule magnets. I'll again, uh, go over the energy scales, which I mentioned in the first lecture. I'll tell you that there's a hierarchy of energy scales going from exchange to anisotropy to dipole interactions. Um, and these are actually icing-like systems. They're magnets that have a preferred access uh, for magnetization, and the fluctuations are between uh, projections on that preferred axis. So anisotropy plays a very important role. And I'll show, show you some of the phenomena that are observed in these materials. One is something called resonant quantum tunneling for magnetization. Um, and you can look at crossovers between different regimes of relaxation, thermal activation over the barrier, thermally assisted tunneling, where you have thermal activation and tunneling events, and then pure quantum tunneling, where the system with quantum fluctuations uh, cause the magnets to, to reverse. And uh, if I have time, I'll tell you about some of the experimental techniques that are being used to grow uh, these, these systems. Okay, so this was also a slide in my first lecture. Uh, we've been now sort of through this side. On large scales, uh, the phenomena you see are dominated by, uh, are determined by nucleation, propagation, and annihilation of domains and domain walls. Uh, if you go to smaller scales, uh, you can imagine a model which considers uh, a system just possessing one magnetic domain. Uh, is reasonable. That occurs in, in this range when, when particles are on the scale of, of, an ex of the exchange length in, in the magnet, where exchange forces dominate. Um, and we, we spoke a little bit about this, uh, and we've heard about this regime, where you have sort of sharp switching, and in very small particles, you can see uh, evidence that you have really close to single magnetic domain behavior, stony Wolfgang and macro spin behavior. And, and now we're going to go down to this scale, to the scale where we have clusters that just have hundreds of magnetic atoms, and we're going to see that quantum mechanics comes in. And quantum mechanics comes in in, in an interesting way, in two ways. One is we're going to have tra quantum transitions between states, say between up and down. But the other thing that's going to be very important is that these materials, the molecules, have discrete states. They have discrete spin states. So uh, you have to consider the discrete level structure understand uh, what's going on, and the hysteresis loops are going to have discrete features in them. Uh, you don't have a continuous relaxation or jumps, you'll have multiple jumps in the hysteresis loops that reflect uh, the quantum nature of these, of these objects. Okay, so um, we're going to, quantum tunneling was first discussed in the context of magnetism in the, in the 1980s. Um, with the idea that what's, t what's tunneling is, is the direction of magnetization. That you have a magnetic system which has two preferred directions, either up or down along a particular axis, and you can have fluctuations between those directions. So you can have thermal activation over the barrier. You can imagine preparing a system in upstate and waiting, and over time, it's a finite temperature, it will find its way uh, to the ground state, the higher the temperature, the faster that, that system will relax. And what was discussed is the possibility that you could have a direct tunneling event uh, where the system wouldn't have to interact with the environment, where you could have transitions, spontaneous transitions between up and down spin projections of a macroscopic magnet, a magnet which consists of thousands of, of atoms um, coupled together. So that would 
would give you a temperature independent behavior, a crossover from a regime which is strongly temperature dependent to a regime where uh, the, the relaxation is virtually independent of temperature. Um, so this, this theoretical work stimulated a lot of work on, on different magnetic systems. People were looking at relaxation phenomena and, and trying to see if you had a temperature independent relaxation uh, process. This is to see evidence of a crossover with quantum machine. Uh, so if they were looking for some crossover, the crossover temperature would depend on the energy barrier as well as the rate of tunneling, how coupled these, these, these states are. Uh, and it was estimated that this could be in the Kelvin range and say, for, you know, for certain types of materials. Um, the difficulty uh, in the early days of these studies was that uh, most people were studying ensembles of magnetic particles, and the ensembles had distributions in their properties. There were distributions in the anisotropy. There would be different numbers of atoms in every particle. And that, but the, this phenomenon is, is really exponentially sensitive to those uh, characteristics. So if you change the number of atoms in your system, you change the energy barrier, which and the rate is exponentially proportional to the energy barrier. The anisotropies determine the coupling between these states, so it's also exponentially sensitive to variations in anisotropy. So as a result, it wasn't easy to, to or it wasn't, it wasn't, there wasn't really clear evidence for a crossover or pure a quantum a type of relaxation. Um, so the field of this, this area of inquiry really accelerated with the discovery of molecules that behave like magnets. Um, and this was done in 1993 um, by the group of Roberta Cecily and, and her collaborators. Uh, what they, so they synthesized magnetic molecules, which I'll tell you about, um, where they uh, look and they looked at the magnetization behavior. This is magnetization versus temperature, uh, cooling in a, uh, in a magnetic field, and then cooling in zero field, and then warming up. And, and you can see this, there's a region where the susceptibility of the magnetization increases as you decrease the temperature. It's behaving like a, a paramagnet or a super paramagnet. And then a region uh, where you have a, a difference between these two, you have irreversibility. Uh, there's, uh, so you have a, a difference between the states when you cool in a field and when you cool in a zero field. And, and those merge at what a temperature called the blocking temperature, a temperature at which the relaxation rates are on the time scale of your experiment. So, uh, and then what they did is they measured hysteresis in this regime below uh, 3 Kelvin, and this is at 2.8 Kelvin, and this is at 2.2 Kelvin, you see hysteresis. And they could uh, show that this was hysteresis was of a purely molecular origin. Often when you see, her, when you see hysteresis in a ferromagnet, it's associated with a long-range behavior. It's associated with the formation of domains, pinning of domains, mm -hmm. nucleation events, things we've, we've been hearing about uh, at the school. But here they could isolate the molecules and show that it was a molecular property, that the hysteresis was associated with uh, something happening within the, within the molecules. So hysteresis of a more molecular origin. And, uh, and shortly thereafter, uh, there were, were, were more detailed studies of the hysteresis phenomena in this, in this material. Uh, this work done at, at City University in the group of Miriam Saracha, um, uh, where they looked at uh, powders of manganese 12, of a material called manganese 12, the same material that was studied earlier and one I'll, I'll tell you about. Um, and they measured magnetization versus magnetic field. And uh, this is again at temperatures below this blocking temperature. These are experiments that are done on the time scales of minutes to, to hours. Uh, and you see hysteresis that opens up as you cool, cool down in temperature. And there was also structure. There's, there's actually uh, wiggles to this hysteresis, steps in the hysteresis, so regions where the magnetization is uh, changing less rapidly than other regions. And they identified, by taking derivatives of this, uh, these hysteresis curves, they ad identified a series of steps. And they could show that the step number uh, scaled with the, the, there was a constant interval between these, uh, between these, step, these steps. So uh, this, this, uh, there's hysteresis of molecular origin. And if you look more closely, you see that, that history, there's actually a structure, a discrete structure in the hysteresis. Can you see what? 
What does it scale with the steps? The steps, basically, you can count the, the, there, this is the field in which the step occurs in the step number. So the interval between steps is, is a constant. So the steps occur at h n, n times h naught, where h naught is some quantum, quantum step. Now please ask, please ask questions as I go along. I know there's a very diverse group here and uh, interests in all kinds of subjects. So, uh, so it's, it's the slope of this curve that, that is this group? Um, it is the interval. Be, it is the so I'll, 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 I'll go into this in a little more detail. It's where the steps occur that are at discrete. They're at discrete values of magnetic field. That's what's uh, and uh, okay. So let me just. Let me just show you. Oh, oh, yes, please. So speaking as somebody who's mostly ignorant in this field, are these discrete steps in any way related to the uh, quantum Hall effect? They're not related to the. Quantum oh, oh, they're not related to the quantum Hall effect. They, but they, they're very reminiscent of the quantum Hall effect in the sense that they become basically completely flat if you go to very, very low temperature. And there, I'll show you examples of that. There, so uh, you get the, when you're at least from an experimental point, you get the same kind of excitement when you see those steps and you see some quantum, but it's completely different physics. <laughs> okay, and um, let's see. That's so that's so it's 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 uh, it's associated with the we'll, we'll we'll see that it's associated with anisotropies of the of the of the material in, in, in this case. Um, so there's another thing I wanted to say about that. It's a, yes, well, they'll probably come to me. I mean, so yes, yeah, so these are the so this, this is, these are the kinds of materials in which uh, these this phenomenon is different. <coughs> single molecule magnets. They're called single molecule magnets because their individual molecules can be magnetized. An exhibit hysteresis. So it's not a collective effect between molecules. It's an individual molecule. Uh, a property, um, and uh, you know, I say to students that if the uh, you know, these are mag magnets, just like your refrigerator magnets, that is, they would stick to the refrigerator. But in this case, they have to be inside the refrigerator because they're only magnetic at very low temperature. They're only, so they only have these properties at below three degrees Kelvin. Okay, so but they're like magnets, like any other. Um, so they're they're molecules, and that's kind of a very nice property. They're, they have discrete structure. You know where every atom is, and that allows you to do really nice uh, measurements and correlations between structure and property that aren't possible uh, if if you do if you're synthesizing materials which have or working with materials that have distributions and, and properties or or have some randomness. Um, the the magnetization in these molecules is the same, like, for example, in isolated atoms or electrons, you Yes. Uh, I'm going to talk about that, but the basic, that these are transition metal uh, materials, which have tr they're transition metal oxides. So there are ox there, um, and each of, and the, each of the ions you can identify a particular uh, a spin state, a particular spin with each of the ions based on Hund's rule and, and its uh, and, and the ion, ion's valence. So the, you know, these are mixed. Some of them are mixed valence systems, but the valences are frozen. So you can think about these as a collection of, of transition metal ions that are coupled together, and they're coupled together by these oxygen uh, bridges. Um, and that gives you what's called super exchange. So there's an exchange interaction here via, via oxygen in almost all cases. So they, so they form beautiful, they're beautiful molecules. You have big systems, they have hundreds, some, some have hundreds of transition metals, you know, up to 300, 400 atoms. Uh, so they're, they're bigger, you know, they're at C60 and more, uh, more, more atoms. They, they form a high spin ground state. So they have actually, some, they typically form a ferry magnetic state. Um, so they're, they're not all the ions have their spins aligned, but there's a net moment on the on these clusters. They have a uniaxial anisotropy. That means they're, they're, there's a preferred direction for the net spin of the molecules to point. Um, so that's that's an important characteristic. So they would like to be magnetized along a particular axis. Now, in contrast to the earlier talk you heard this morning, these form single crystals. So you're not working with one molecule. You're working with an ensemble of molecules, anywhere from 10 to the 14th to 10 to the 10 to the 30th molecules in a crystal. 
So these are millimeter-sized crystals where the molecules uh, are, are arranged in a van der Waal crystal. So the, the interaction between molecules is weak. There's still dipole interactions, but there, there's almost no exchange interaction between molecules. So these, these form, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're really working with a large ensemble. And if, if, you, if you can assume that the, the, the molecules are weakly interacting, that by measuring the properties of the ensemble, you can get single molecule properties. Um, that assumption breaks down at some scale, but the scale at pretty low temperature for many of these molecules. Um, there's also an emphasis now to really get to the point where you can measure single molecules. And at the end of the talk, I'll show you some of the techniques are be, that are being used to try and probe an individual molecule. Um, it, it would be, of course, very interesting to be able to probe uh, individual molecules of, of, this, of this type. You know, this type, and you would get different kinds of information when you get them measured in some ensembles. These are synthesized in solution, so they basically precipitate out. You start with transition metal salts, and these, uh, and they, these precipitate out. It, at sometimes it, as crystals, as single crystals. And, and chemists have learned uh, how to modify them chemi chemically. You can change the ligands. There's, uh, there's organic ligands around these clusters that isolate them. Um, you can change uh, the oxidation state. So you could, you could change a system which has an even number of electrons to make it to an odd number of electrons. That could be interesting because uh, even numbers spin state should be degenerate by Kramer's theorem, so you shouldn't have tunneling in those systems. Uh, they're soluble, so if, you, if you're interested in how, whether the interactions are important, you can dilute the, these materials in a solvent and then study a very dilute solution. Um, of course, what you lose in, that res in, in doing that is the orientation. In a crystal, all of the molecules have, exact, have the same orientation, and if you dilute them, you lose that, but you can still get information. And it's recently been shown, actually, this has been done in Constance, it's beautiful work, that these can be bonded to surfaces, so you can put these into, um, into two dimensions. That's been a, that's been a very recent uh, advance, uh, so you can now even create two-dimensional layers of these molecules. Can you deposit these using a practical group? There are different techniques. These, are, these can't typically be deposited by physical <coughs> techniques. They're, they're done by chemical techniques. So um, they're done along the line of preparing a surface, preparing a surface with the appropriate functionalization, and then, then linking these molecules to that functionalized surface. So it's, 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 it's wet, chem wet chemistry kind of techniques that need to be deployed here. Um, so in this work, actually, the work that was done on the surfaces, they showed that they can do wet chemistry and then put these molecules into a UHV environment and, and image them with an STM. So that's pretty remarkable, actually, that you can go from wet, wet, a wet environment to a UHV environment and have the molecules intact on the surface. Uh, so you can then employ some of the powerful techniques we have to look at individual molecules with uh, microscopy uh, with these systems. So that's very, very new. Um, so these are the these these molecules, manganese 12, which uh, and iron 8 are the most widely studied. Uh, molecules, and those are the ones I'm going to mainly mention because I can illustrate almost all of the physics uh, that's been discovered in these mo with these two two examples. So, Excuse me, just yes. uh, sort of historically, you say it's remarkable you can synthesize in the uh, in solution and then go to a UHV environment. You know that's what electrochemists did all the time before the NC uh, local probes came around like in the last 15 years or so. You, mm -hmm. you deposit it, go to UHV, hope that nothing changes mm -hmm. too badly. Mm -hmm. I still think it's remarkable. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Indeed. Um, so these are the these are the kind of uh, things that have been seen. I showed you that the first thing was that an individual molecule can be magnetized and exhibit magnetic hysteresis. Um, quantum tunneling of the magnetization, which I'll describe, was was discovered in 1995. Quantum interference, quantum phase interference, was was seen experimentally in, uh, in a few years later. Um, and I'll show you close to it. Recently, um, there are people have demonstrated, various groups, uh, mining 
as well, has been working on this problem of coherence. Can you actually create a coherence between uh, different spin projections? And under this talk, I'll cover these two aspects in, in some detail. Um, by starting basically by describing the interactions in this system, manganese twelve acetate. So this is the first material to be dis to be studied in detail. Um, manganese twelve acetate. It was synthesized by chemists actually in 1980, and it's kind of sat on a shelf until somebody actually looked carefully at the susceptibility. It's a uh, manganese 12 O12 core, so it's a manganese oxide, um, and this is what the core looks like. These are the manganese atoms. There are eight manganese uh, around a central core of four manganese, and these are again all, all bridged by oxygen bridges, and they have uh, ligands, uh, uh, acidic acid ligands, and there's also acidic acid and water, acetate ligands, sorry, and acidic acid and water groups that uh, live on the outside of this cluster that sit between clusters in the crystal. Um, the outer uh, manganese are manganese 3, and that has a spin of 2 by Hunt's rules, and, and the inner core is manganese 4 and has a spin of 3 halves, and it turns out these two couple in such a way that they, they end up anti-parallel, and so the net ground state is 8 times 2 minus 4 times 3 halves, or, or 10. So it's a ferrimagnetic uh, ground state. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little more in detail about that. Um, these, have a, these molecules have a high degree of symmetry. You're looking down um, the, one of the, the symmetry axis, the S4 axis. And this is also an easy direction for magnetization. So the most important energy is exchange that locks the spins together. And the next most important is the anisotropy that leads to a preferred direction. So these manganese three that have a, they're, 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 they're an octahedral uh, coordination and there's, a, there's an elong, the elongation of one of the oxygen manganese bonds uh, perpendicular to the plane of this uh, slide. Um, and that, that Jan Teller distortion is what is at the origin of the anisotropy of the cluster. So you have all these, these manganese, um, their single ion anisotropy, the ion anisotropy combines to give the cluster a net anisotropy. So the most important energy exchange, the second most important energy is the anisotropy energy, which is about 60 degrees Kelvin. Um, that sets the scale for the energy barrier to reverse the spin um, from up to down. And um, there's also weak intermolecular dipole interactions. The scale, this is this is the scale of the nearest of interactions between neighbors, uh, neighboring uh, manganese 12 ions. So these these form single crystals of, uh, and uh, this is an example of a manganese 12 single crystal. It's a, this is about 100 microns wide by by uh, 500 microns long, and it's sitting on top of one of the measurement devices that we use. This is. Actually, this is a Hall magnetometer, um, so we, we, we couple magnetic field from the crystal into a, into a Hall bar and measure the Hall voltage to deduce the, uh, the magnetization uh, response. Um, so that's that's the so we're looking at many many molecules and looking at their the, the ensemble characteristics. So if you dive into the molecule a little bit, this is a schematic of the of the interactions. Um, each of the inner core are li linked to the outer core, uh, the spin 3 half to the spin 2 by two oxygen bridges, which, which you, we characterize by some exchange constant J1. The inner uh, core, uh, we, we write, we, or there's additional interactions in the inner part, which, uh, which is characterized by J3. So you have three uh, different kinds of, ex four different kinds of exchange pathways in this, in this system. And you can write down a Heisenberg Hamiltonian uh, to describe this cluster, which which has these these interactions in it. Um, so this uh, this is the Heisenberg. And there's also a single ion anisotropy. So uh, preferred direction for the single ions, the, the manganese three, uh, which you can write uh, like this. So J1 is the largest interactions. It's 215 Kelvin, and this. Uh, is an antiferromagnetic interaction. So it sets the, it's, it, this is what's, what causes these two spins to be anti-parallel. The other interactions are all are, are a weaker scale, so those interactions end up frustrated. In the ground state, what you have is a, um, is, is, is uh, this, this alignment is the lowest energy state, so about, below about 30 Kelvin, you form this kind of ordered state, 
um, with, with this ferromagnetic order. So you start out with a Hilbert space that is 10 to the 8th, and then because of the strong exchange at low enough temperature, uh, you can go into a manifold of spin 10. You only have 21 states to worry about, 2s plus 1 uh, states to worry about. So uh, this, you can think about this as a, ma a microscopic view of a single domain system. And the reason we can think about a single domain as having you know, two degrees of freedom in the classical case is because exchange is so large, we can forget about the degrees of freedom of the individual spins in a, in a cluster. Do you have a question? Yeah. So, this way is the spin pointing over? Is this a flat system and oh. spin pointing out? Or? Yeah, yeah, the spins are, um, this is a more, the, the spins are pointing out of the page in this, in this direct, in this, in this, in this, uh, well, along, along the S4 axis. So um, it's not a planar molecule, but it's, it's, it's a, uh, I think it, it's asymmetric. It's, it's, uh, it's, I believe it's, it's uh, wider in this direction than it is in, 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 the, uh, in the S4 dire in the direction of the S4 axis. These I didn't mention, these are the lattice constants of the crystal. So each of the molecules is separated by one to two nanometers from each other. They form actually a body center tetragonal a lattice. Is there some superheats between the outer core of enemies? Um, between the outer core of, of separated diamonds, um, that's broken because of the, to, to a large extent, because of the organic ligands on the outside of the cluster. So there are situations that you can, you can engineer, you can chemically engineer, where you have exchange coupling between molecules. Um, and uh, but in, this, in these molecules, it, 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 the exchange is very, very weak. It's mainly dipole interaction. There's actually a beautiful example of a manganese fork dimer where the chemist succeeded to couple two dimers by exchange. And then you could have, uh, then you could look at the coupled system and you'd have actually dynamics associated with, of this coupled system. Uh, and there's, a, there's some very beautiful work on that. Um, I would say the emphasis so far, though, has been on systems where you, you build up, you don't have extended exchange, you build up exchange like uh, one by, you know, so you have dimers or trimers on that and not scale. And uh, I guess one of the big uh, goals in the field would be to find a way to control the exchange. If you could put a linker where you could turn on and off the exchange, that would be very, very interesting. And the chemists are working on trying to find ways to manipulate exchange. Um, the, the, it, would be, it would be very nice to have tunability in a particular system. So right now we have tunability in some if someone gives you a crystal and they've made some changes, but it, it would be very nice if we could, if they, we could actively change the characteristics and, and look at, their, at the response. That's, that's an active uh, research area. Okay. How do you do that? Yes, equal ten. You have um, you have eight um, s equals two ions, sixteen, and then you have four s equals three half ions. So it's sixteen minus minus six yes. gives you that. That gives you this. So it's a very magnetic ground state of the of the cluster. Okay. So just kind Yes. Well, so oh, okay. How do you that? Okay, that's a, yeah, that's a separate question. Okay, so this so that so this is the these interactions you can deduce from uh, experiments and some knowledge of the chemistry. Um, the S equals ten ground state you can show most clearly by doing spectroscopy. So you what you can do what's called EPR spectroscopy, electron paramagnetic resonance. And from the number of transitions you see in the electron, you have, if you have 21 levels, you have a certain number of transitions you could have, 20 possible transitions. So by doing EPR, you can, you, you can reduce the spin state. So the spin state can be reduced through EPR, also through magnetization measurements. If you accurately measure the magnetization and you know the moment of each cluster, you can also reduce the spin state. So those are, this, um, this is the, uh, this can be deduced from experiment, and these parameters can also be determined experimentally to 
I'd say you can, the spin 10 state can be definitively established experimentally. These parameters, it's not, they're not unique fits to determine these parameters. Uh, the what is the second that's, a, that's a single ion anisotropy. So that's a, a D uh, S I squared. Maybe it should, it's, it, it, it's, it's set, so D is a tensor. It, can, it picks a particular direction, in this case, the Z direction. For, uh, for the preferred uh, access. And you don't consider, you do not consider uh, super exchange interaction. And this, these are, this, these are the, this is the super exchange, this characterizes the super exchange interaction. So it's a, it's a, it's a anti-ferromagnetic interaction. So these, these, this, these, this number characterize this, the exchange between uh, this manganese and, and this manganese through these two oxygen bridges. Well, the question is that the exchange interaction, but what's the exchange interaction? This is a model, yeah, this is a model. I'm characterizing the super exchange by, by the effective interaction between the two, between the two sides. You're worried about the anisotropy of, these, of the exchange interaction? <laughs> Is S I cos S G and then got some some of the super exchange. That would be an anisotropic exchange interaction. <coughs> I'm, I'm some characterizing this by an isotropic exchange interaction. It is possible, of course, to have an isotropic exchange, but um, maybe, we have to, maybe we should discuss this later. Um, so once you once you're in the spin 10 manifold, you've, you've taken exchange. You, you can go. This is the this is a quantum version of the of the uh, single domain model that I discussed on on Monday. Uh, you say that the, the energy depends on the uh, on the on ds squared, the projection of the spin on the z axis. So if, if d is positive, uh, the system wants to maximize the z projection. Um, and uh, you know, if, we, if this was like n, this it, in the first lecture, this was n z squared. So, so now instead of the difference here now, that in, the, if, if, if in this Hamiltonian uh, minus d s z squared, s z states of the uh, are eigenstates of s z. So you can characterize the states by their projection on the on the z axis. And so you have 21 possible levels. And it's customary, uh, you could just draw out these 21 levels, it's customary to classify them as to whether their projections are positive or negative along the z-axis to kind of to make the correspondence with the classical model uh, of, of an energy uh, barrier. So the energies just go as minus the m squared, and uh, you have a ladder of states where the energies get closer as you go up, and you have an energy barrier that's ds squared. And d is about 0.6 Kelvin, S squared is, uh, is 100, so that gives you the energy barrier of 60 degrees uh, Kelvin. And if you want to think about this classically, this is at the same energy surface we, uh, we saw on Monday. There's a north and a south pole and an energy barrier to reverse. If you want to think about this quantum mechanically, you have to, if you want to have transitions and, and, and dynamics, you need to have some coupling between these states, which is not yet, we haven't put any, any in yet. Okay, we just, we're just describing what, what an ideal axially symmetric molecule, a molecule with cylindrical symmetry, uh, would have. Um, so you can, the relaxation processes you can have if you're at high temperature, uh, you should be able to think about this classically, that you have thermal activation up to the top of the barrier, and then, and then, relax, then uh, relaxation. So um, if this is occurring on a fast enough time scale, much faster than your measurement time, if you measure the magnetization while you, along the z-axis when you apply a field, you'll get a, uh, a, a curve like this, a Brillouin function, um, which just reflects the, uh, the equilibrium of magnetization in any particular field. So this is called superparamagnetic behavior. The, the system is just behaving like a paramagnet. Instead of being an individual spin, it's a collection of spins, so that's where the super uh, comes in. Um, and so the slope is, is higher than you would have for a, uh, a paramagnet. Um, if you go to lower temperature, uh, you would have 
Um, you have a situation where uh, the system can't reverse uh, thermally. Um, now you have to worry about the level structure. You didn't even have to worry about the level structure at high temperature, but now it becomes particularly uh, uh, important. Um, that is, that there can only what, what, there can only be transitions uh, when levels are crossing. So you can't can only have changes in the projection of the spin when you have uh, levels of different spin projection that cross. And if you, so you, if you now apply a magnetic field along the z-axis, um, though you, you find that the energy is just given by this expression, now you have an additional uh, Zeeman term, and you, you, you could easily, you'll easily work out that you have level crossings when a magnetic field is an integer, k, times a quantum, which depends on the anisotropy and the g-factor and the Born magneton, so just these constants. So that's the origin of this of this quantumness it's of the steps is that you can only have dynamics when there's particular at particular values of magnetic field when you have level crossings in the system. So it's it's uh, it's it's uh, understanding where the steps occur is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, you have level crossings, and this is an example of measurement. Uh, this is done on a single crystal. So now that these are much much sharper steps, and probably at around one Kelvin. Um, so you see a step near 0, 0 0.51, 1 1.5. And the picture you have here is at 0, you have all these levels to be in resonance. That is, that you can have potentially have transitions through the whole ladder of states. But if you change the magnetic field a little bit, uh, these levels are off resonance. So there's, there's no possibility for the dynamics. In fact, the relaxation slows down. And this is what gets, gets experimentalists so excited. You can sit here for a long, long time. The relaxation is hundreds of times slower than it is when you're on resonance. And then you go a little bit further and you can turn on the relaxation again. So you can go on and off and on. And that's, that's the basic origin of this, uh, of this step structure in the hysteresis loop. So what's the origin of the different uh, sizes of the steps? That's a very good question. Um, if, I, if, you don't, if, if the end you tell me, it, it has to do, of course, with how the, the states are coupled. What's the... And, but I'll, I'll, I hopefully that will be clear at the, in, in a few minutes. It, so you have different steps, right? You have a very small step, bigger, bigger, and so on. Um, and and, and uh, there's two things going on. I mean, one, look, is, one is it's, it, that as you buy it, the coupling between the, the states depends on which level pairs you have and the mechanism that couples them. And I mean, I'll let, me, let me go on a little bit, and, if, and please ask that question again if, I, if it's not clear. So, uh, so uh, this eight figure in the condition, the condition of the state is uh, in the sum uh, state in the left hand Yes. And, the, and then if you uh, reverse the field, if you change the field directly, you change the field directly, you, you should uh, be some numbers in this transition, you can go from this state to the uh, state. This, that's, that's right. It depends on how, this is a dynamic phenomenon, so it depends on how fast you apply the magnetic field. If you apply very quick magnetic fields, you expect to see, uh, they have bigger hysteresis, large, and, and step, you expect to see bigger step, steps of larger K, larger magnetic fields. Mm -hmm. So you can't see a step, so once the system has relaxed, there's no possibility. So if you, this is a dynamic, so these, the size of the steps and, where, and how many you see depends on how fast you're, um, doing the experiment, how fast you're ramping the magnetic field in this case. So you need a non-zero matrix element between the states. That's right, exactly. You need, so nothing I've shown now tells you why, why there is tunneling. In fact, that was uh, one of the big questions in the, in, in the beginning. Of this. We, need, we need something that doesn't commute with SZ, so if we have an axially symmetric system, we won't have any dynamics. Um, but we can at least understand where the steps are, are occurring, and we, now we just need to find out what that interaction is. Or we can do, or we can, in the laboratory, we can apply a transverse field to create an interaction which breaks the symmetry and causes the defect. And, and that's, I'll tell you about that. Um, so there's, I told you, there's thermally, there's thermal activation over the barrier. There's also a, po a possibility of a process where there's thermal activation up to some excited state and then, and then tunneling across uh, the barrier. So you can, this is called thermally assisted tunneling. And so as you go to higher temperature, you have population 
in these, in these levels, and you can have processes that take you across the barrier at some high level in, in the scheme. Can you distinguish between the tunneling from, say, the n plus 8 to the n minus 2 state here and the relaxation from n minus 2 to n minus 10? Can you distinguish in the experiment? Yeah. In the experiment. Um, this, so you can actually. I, mean, I, would, I would anticipate that there would be some sort of signal as, as it yes, releases this, some energy yeah, this to, you to make the transition. This down. you could distinguish through the heat relief. So you could distinguish that there's heat released in the system. If you could accurately calibrate that heat, you might know which level pairs are, are participating in that process. You could also do spectroscopy, which, is, which would tell you which levels are being populated during, the, during this process. And, if, and you can do a spectroscopy actually tell you which level pairs are the important ones in the process, in, the, in, this, in, this, in the tunneling process. But in the, in the uh, this time scale is fairly quick. The relaxation is a fairly quick process com in, in, in compared to uh, the uh, <coughs> process in, this, uh, in, the, in these hysteresis measurements I'm showing you. So what's the time scale we're talking about? This so the, means? the time scale of the in, in this in this in the hysteresis experiment, the time scales are like kilo per milliseconds for tunneling, and the relaxation times are microseconds mm -hmm. for the from these excited states. Just wondering when, when you have thermally assisted quantum tunneling, whether I can pretty much assume that it's just one transition because it because it'll it's much less likely to be excited to the next energy level. On the other hand, if at the lower level energy level the barrier is much wider and suppresses the quantum transition. Yes. Like You're anticipating my my talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bright craft. <laughs> yes. And last question. Uh, so, uh, if you consider, uh, if this, the material is not, it is not enough, it, is it possible for some other study in, in, uh, in other S, for other study in other S, then will be yeah, that's it, that's a very good question. I mean, could there be other spin multiplets that are important in the relaxation processes? Could you have excitations to say s equal nine and then transition yeah. across? That's that's potentially possible. That depends on the on the scale of the exchange interaction. It, it, it's potentially possible. It's been so you could potentially imagine a situation where you have both other spin multiplets that come into the dynamics of the system. How would you distinguish that experimentally? How would you distinguish that experimentally? Um, I would think that probably the most direct probe would be a spectroscopic probe. So you, you know, I was going to talk about EPR. I'm not going to. I do. I can pull those. I can later on if there's time. But you can, through EPR, you can actually monitor the populations of the excited of the states and know because the, these are not equal distance, you have a signature for each for the for the state that these these, these spins traverse. So you can do spectroscopy of the of these processes. Uh, um, so finally, this is so this is what you were talking about. Um, so. One question is, how do you actually go from a thermally activated process over the barrier to quantum tunneling? Uh, and this is one paper that was written on, on the subject. You could have, actually, a transition where uh, the, the, so this is the log of the rate of transitions uh, versus temperature. You could have different types of crossover phenomena. You could have a crossover where the log of the rate is a smooth function of temperature. Or you could have a crossover where there's a discontinuity in the slope with the log of the rate versus temperature. And so these have been called first and second order transitions, and these correspond uh, to what Pierre was, was talking about, that is the, the, the energy that's important, the, the levels that, that, that are important for the relaxation can change as you change the temperature. At high temperature at the top of the barrier, and at low temperature, there's no thermal excitation. It has to be through the bottom of the barrier. The question is, how does it go from one to the other? It can go 
it's kind of down the down the level scheme. That is, as you lower the temperature, you can sample lower and lower levels in the scheme. Or you could have a situation where there's the rate is so much hot you have you have two exponentials in some sense. You have a very the, the split the coupling between levels at the top of the scheme is much much larger than those at the bottom. But the thermal population of the states at the top level is exponentially small. So you have these competing factors. And you can have a case where the where transitions at the top of the level can can effectively compete with transitions at the bottom just because of these, these two, two exponential factors. And I think there's, it depends basically on the form of the interaction that breaks the symmetry. And it in a classical, in a particle, in a, in a potential well, it depends on the, the, the potential, whether it's uh, minus x squared plus x to the fourth or minus <coughs> x squared minus x to the fourth, whether the potential gets steeper or shallower as you, um, as you, as you go out in x. And, and what this paper showed is that you can map the problem of the spin tunneling onto this kind of particle problem. And then a uniaxial magnet with a small transverse field uh, can behave, can have this kind of a sharp transition between a thermal activation near the top of the barrier and thermal activate and, and tunneling near the bottom of the potential oh, well. So, right, so that the, this can be probed in experiment, right? um, and I, 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 I probably should have shown the slide about how that that works. But um, this is a this is a this is this is a level. This is an experiment we did actually on this problem, and it, it, it turns out in manganese 12, uh, there's an additional uh, higher order anisotropy uh, in the of the molecules. A term that goes as B S C to the fourth. Uh, that's been determined spectroscopically. So you have a, a, a you, there's a small term that actually leads to a situation where levels in different uh, height, different m, cross at different longitudinal magnetic fields. So instead of the crossing the fields at which two levels cross being just n times an integer, and, and an integer times a quantum and magnetic field, you now have additional uh, an additional uh, term that where the uh, where the where, where, which depends on which levels are crossing, which we're calling the escape level. And this shows the Zeeman diagram. This is the these are uh, the, the where, where you're just looking at the energy relative uh, to the energy of the n equals 10 state. And you're looking at how, at when you apply a magnetic field, you're seeing where m equals 10 crosses m equals minus 9, crosses m equals minus 8, and 7. But as you go up, as you go up in the scheme, these levels cross a slightly different uh, applied uh, magnetic fields. So by looking actually carefully at the hysteresis loops, you can tell which level pairs are, 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 are dominating the relaxation process. So that was kind of fortunate. Um, you know, you have a scheme, you can do just spectroscopy by just doing hysteresis measurements. I know when you, so uh, it's, it's, uh, this is an example, so this is an example of experiments which, which we did to look at the transition. You can look at the transit. This is relaxation. These are relaxation experiments. You just apply a magnetic field and you wait and you watch the magnetization decay. Um, and uh, these are experiments of the function temperature. If you do that, you can see that at some temperature, about one degree Kelvin, the curves all start to overlap. And uh, and at that point, there's, there's no longer any temperature dependence for the relaxation. That shows you're crossing over to the pure quantum regime. But you can also do an experiment where you sweep the magnetic field and you take the this is the derivative of the magnetization uh, hysteresis loop, um, and, and and so the derivative correspond the maximum maximum and the derivative correspond to points where the loop is steepest, where the relaxation is fastest, and if you look carefully, you can see peaks in this in this uh, in this in this uh, loop in this in this derivative, and it, and you can follow basically where the maximal change in magnetization is occurring. Um, so as you go from one degree down to point uh, six degrees, you can see there's first the relaxation occurs at lower magnetic field, and then as you lower the temperature, it starts to occur at higher longitudinal magnetic field, and then it stays uh, independent of temperature. And this is at a, a field of 20 degrees to the axial direction, and this is a field of 30 degrees. Um, so we could follow this, and, and in the case where the field was Axial. What you see is that you have a 
the dominant levels in the scheme are, 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 are higher up, and then you have a trend, and for about, in, about, in a region of about one Kelvin, you have transitions that are dominated by these, these levels, and then in a very narrow interval of temperature, um, 0.1 Kelvin, you, 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 go to tel- you go to transitions that are dominated by, by, tra- by tunneling from the, from the ground state. Um, so this is, a, nice, this is a, sam- a, a system where you can really look carefully at how the system goes from thermally activation to, to pure quantum tunneling. Um, and recently, uh, Wolfgang Zwerzig has repeated this experiment on, even, on better crystals than we had uh, at the time. And you could really distinguish fine details of this, of this transition from, from thermal activation, thermally assisted tunneling to pure quantum tunneling. Okay, now I'm going to come to this question of what causes the tunneling. Um, you can apply it, in those experiments, we apply the transverse field to break the symmetry. Uh, but there's a basic question of intrinsically what breaks the symmetry of, that si- of the system. And um, so what is this term, basically, in the Hamiltonian that doesn't commute with SV? Um, so basically, this t- the form it can have is determined by the symmetry of the molecules. And uh, for iron 8, iron 8 has lower symmetry, C2 site symmetry. The first allowed term is of, is of this form, ES x squared minus SY squared, which says that the x-axis is harder than the y-axis. So there's a hard and a medium axis in the plane, in the x-y plane. Uh, for manganese 12, uh, the first allowed term has to have the symmetry of the molecule and has to be, it has to basically have the same, you have to have the same uh, uh, interaction in x or y. This is the first allowed term. It's x plus to the fourth plus s minus to the fourth. So it's an interaction that couples M's that differ by four times an integer. Not, whereas this term couples uh, spins that differ by, spin projections that differ by two times an integer. That's the selection, That's the selection moves, the raising and lowering operators. Uh, how do you, what's the matrix element between N and M? And it's, um, and so writing SX out in terms of the raising and lowering operators in this directly, you see it has to couple states. In first order, it only couples states that differ by Four in second order by eight, and, and, and so on. Yes. Yeah. That is, you still have. Um, you have Kramer's degeneracy only if you have a an odd uh, spin, uh, odd integer oh, spin. Oh yes, right. So this, but you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It would conserve it for an odd spin, but not for this even spin. System. Yes, that's right. Okay. And so one of the, this is now uh, work that this is work on iron eight, um, in which um, these are again hysteresis loop measurements. So you see the the steps, magnetization versus longitudinal field, and uh, these are now several different transverse fields. So, several, so you transfer field from zero up to 0.2, or close to 0.2, and you can see steps, and you can see as you increase the transverse field, the, the step height increases. So that's what you'd expect. You're coupling the levels to a greater extent. The tunneling rate is in, increasing. Uh, if you want to think about this, you can think about this as an anti-crossing of levels. So you would start with a spin up, down, and you're, and you're sweeping the magnetic field. And these levels have an avoided crossing where the, the avoided crossing is set by the matrix elements that break the symmetry. Um, and tunneling corresponds to staying on this lower branch. If, if you swept infinitely slowly, you would go adiabatically and stay on the lower branch, and you would, and you would have a step in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the hysteresis loop that reflects the change in projection of that state as, as, you, as you sweep the magnetic field. What's, what's, what happens then is, as in this, it is that as if you keep if you increase the magnetic field further, so this is now if you go from here to here, you can actually see that the step height decreases. So everything looks like just breaking symmetry, increasing tunneling, increasing the splitting, making the transitions more adiabatic, and then um, if you go further, you see something interesting actually. That you, that you actually, the step height is decreasing as you go to. Fr- yeah, go to uh, greater, um, greater transverse fields. Um, 
So you can use a, this lambda zener, what's called the lambda zener formula. If you measure basically the change, the change in population, that is the magnetization, after you cross a step, you can determine if, the ensemble, if you have an ensemble that's weakly interacting, etc. You can determine the and you, you can determine the splitting between the states. So you can determine the splitting by knowing by just knowing what the probabilities of tunneling of making the up transition, so measuring how much did the magnetization change versus the full change in magnetization. So that, that's, that's is where you can, you could just, in fact, or you could just say, plot, you could just use delta M, the change in delta M to infer the, 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 the splitting here. And if you do that, you find this. So this is the tunnel splitting infer, inferred from these hysteresis loop measurements. You can see a beautiful oscillation um, which reflects you know, that, his, that changing delta m as you change the transverse field. It's not a monotonic uh, function of the of the transverse field. So uh, this it depends actually on which level pairs are crossing. This is n equals zero for the symmetric situation. This is a bias situation with further bias. Um, and this is one of the big discoveries in this area was uh, quantum interference and spin tunneling. Um, this was an effect called the spin parity effect in quantum tunneling. It was first uh, proposed theoretically uh, by Daniel Lost and, and by, uh, by Von Delft and Henry uh, at the same time. And uh, what, what they said is that it need to, you, if you have tunneling in a system, you can have a situation where you have interference. Um, that is, the, if you think about the axial system, the tunneling can be a, a reversal of the spins either clockwise or counterclockwise. And there's a phase associated with the spin traversing these paths, very phase. And those, the phase can be such that there could be destructive interference, and you're basically the splitting goes to zero. You can see that either through this kind of class. So this was a showing how you include the quantum phase in the classical uh, picture you have for, for tunneling of a big spin, the Lagrangian for a big spin system. You could also see the same physics by just looking at the spin Hamiltonian and diagonalizing it and seeing that you actually get. Get zeros. This is actually so. This this is actually what you'd expect for that spin Hamiltonian I, I, I showed you. If you have E S X squared minus S Y squared, you actually have maximum and minima in the splitting that reflect uh, that that reflect the symmetry. You have a, a maximum at zero, and this, and this, if you like, this could be. You could. This is so. These points would be points where selection rules would prevent would prevent the uh, tunnel. I remember for only half integers in the which can be perfectly destructive. That's right. For half in, well this is this should be perfectly destructive in that simple model. Um, but yes, for half integer spinning with, you know, there should be uh, also if with no magnet if there are no magnetic fields that so if there's time reversal it should be perfectly destructive. That's right. So this was a very nice. Actually, this was actually predicted for a biaxial system before we knew, before we, we had found a system that would, would was biaxial in this type. So this was a very nice and actually a prediction for exactly the Hamiltonian. And the reason these don't go to zero is likely that there are magnetic fields involved. In fact, you know we've thrown away all the dipole fields. There are also hyperclined fields. So there are things that break that symmetry uh, in, in, in the in the real system. Um, and you can also, this is a picture of how what the energy surface looks like, and these are the tunneling paths that are interfering. And as you, so you're applying a field along the hard axis, you're distorting the paths and bringing them more toward the field direction, so you're changing the path length, you're changing the area encompassed on, this, on a sphere, and you're changing, that's how you change the phase. And uh, so if, you, if the field is perfectly aligned, you, can, you have a strong interference. And if you break that symmetry by applying the field at an angle, you also wash out that, that interference pattern. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, very, it's a, it's a very beautiful result, this quantum interference in, in, in single molecule magnets. Um, OK, I guess I'm nearing the end. I, I, I'll show you some of the techniques that are, that are being used uh, for studying these. There are a number of techniques. I mean, actually, could give a whole lecture on the and more on the, on the techniques that are being used. I and mean, I think the important ones are spectroscopy, EPR spectroscopy, 
allows it to determine the spin monotonium parameters. Standard uh, magnetic measurement susceptibility is very important toward establishing uh, the, the, the spin states and the interactions. Uh, neutron scattering has been used to, uh, to look at the spin density of the various sites and also to look at the spin excitations. You can, you can look at different spin multiplets by exciting the system with, with neutrons, so you can look at the, at the J. And these are techniques that I've been working on, Hull effect techniques, which allow you to, to sample the, the magnetization of, a small, of small clusters of, or of, of basically these crystals. And then the other technique that's been used is micro squids, where you, where you look, use a, a superconducting quantum interference device to look at the magnetization or the flux coming from the, the samples. This, this is the technique we're using in my lab um, in Florida. Uh, Steve von Molnar has developed these techniques down to the point where you can detect uh, single particles on the order of yes. 10 to the second, 10 to the second Bohr magnetons, which is remarkable. Mm -hmm. Now, in order to get to detect a single molecule, you would need Bohr magneton type sensitivities. Uh, that's in principle possible uh, with squids. Uh, you want to say something? Uh, just, uh, just the music. When, when they first got that single particle, like you know, Steve just ran around from office to office showing the results. So, 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 so I was, I, I think you probably know I was a postdoc with Steve. Yeah. And we, we developed, we started to do this, these measurements at that, developed the ball bars at that time. And then, yeah, then we, you know, the goal was even in night to, to do that. And I, I, I'm very amazed that he actually stuck with it for so long. <laughs> I don't have the patience to do that. But, uh, but he, yes, it's really amazing, actually, that he gets to have a single spin. And, and, where I, and, I, and there's some really remarkable work also going on uh, in Grenoble, um, where they're using, where they're trying to develop a nano squid, which would be able to detect a single molecule. So the idea is to replace one of the weak links of the squid with a carbon nanotube, cover of nature. Uh, and so this is niobium. This is a single wall nanotube. And the idea is to put a molecule right on the nanotube so you could sense the magnetic moment of an individual molecule. These are pretty hard experiments. I think I'd rather do pull I'd rather pull molecules with an AFM <laughs> <laughs> than try to do this experiment. Uh, but it's 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 really it's getting close to the point where you could interrogate an individual molecule. This technique may be one that allows you to get down to single molecules. Uh, there's also magnetic resonance force microscopy. They're able to detect single nuclear spins with, uh, with, with resonance force microscopy. So uh, we're getting to the point where we can start to think about being able to interrogate uh, individual uh, molecules and look at their properties uh, on the surface. So this is what I told you about. I told you just to give you a big a little introduction to the field. Um, there's a lot of physics going on in this area, um, and, and, and most of the work so far has been done on three-dimensional crystals, but there's now work on surfaces and so on, and, and uh, these are the kinds of things that we've, we've actually really been able to look very carefully at this phenomenon of quantum tunneling, thermally activated tunneling, thermally assisted and purely we've been able to look at the crossover between the regimes. There's been this nice, very nice discovery of quantum phase interference, first theoretical and then experimental, and there it's also led to, to, to do to, to experimentalists to push the experimental techniques to increase the sensitivity of the, of the methods. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for your lecture. We have still have time for a couple of questions. Yeah, you mentioned there was interest in actually controlling this exchange, but how would you how would you do that? It's open, I guess, if somebody has a good idea. So one, one thought is there, there are these materials called these spin crossover materials, um, which they are mentioned on, on, on Monday, um, where you can change the spin state by, by, by light. So you can change the electronic configuration of a, of a cobalt ion in a molecule by putting light on. So one thought would be to couple molecules via these, uh, by these kinds of uh, systems by these spin crossover molecules and then activate that, that the spin on that site with light so that you turn on an exchange on a, on a pathway for, for exchange. Okay, that's one idea. Another idea would be to, to somehow use electric fields in the, in the molecules to modulate the anisotropies and, and the uh, and exchange. 
Um, and some of these materials are similar to ferroelectrics. They don't have inversion symmetry. So you could expect to uh, be able to modulate their properties through few electric fields. But I don't know how you would exactly couple two molecules with electric fields, but you could imagine somehow getting some tunability with, with electric fields in these, in these systems. There's a, there's a recent paper, a PRL by, um, by the group of the Basel by Daniel Loss on how you could potentially use electric fields to control interactions in these, these kinds of molecules. Um, I think if you ask 10 people, you might get 10 different answers on how you might do this. But if you, so if you have a good idea, uh, that would be, uh, you know, would be uh, certainly, if, if that can be realized, I think people would be very, very interested. So, this is going back to the land of the picture. So, what part of the Hamilton decides the crossover? Like, what, what dictates the way this crossover looks? What dictates the way the crossover looks is the is that is the is the perturbation that breaks the axial symmetry, right? So so that if without that this would just be two levels that just just cross. So the form this this delta is determined by that by those transverse interactions by the H T this H well here I wrote it as H A this 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 uh, this term. Um, so, so you can, it can be intrinsic anisotropies, it can, and it can be magnetic fields that break the symmetry. It can be external magnetic fields as well as internal magnetic fields. It can be dipole fields or hyperfine fields in, 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 in the system. So parts of them, parts are intrinsic to the systems, and parts you can you can modulate in, in, in the experiment. Yes. Uh, I, I think your explanation Almost making a computer. This explanation is uh, for, for, the, for the next uh, slide. So, uh, why the, the common speaking is uh, the oscillation is the reverse of the computer? Why does it oscillate? Why is it um, Okay. There, I could give you a very. Uh, I, the, the physical picture is that you that your energy surface looks like this. So okay, imagine this is uh, kind of a figure eight. Okay, so there's a, uh, the north pole is, is a minimum and the south pole is a minimum. And, and we're interested in transitions between the north and south poles. Um, those, so this, the, in, the x-axis is a, is a hard magnetic axis. So that would be a hard direction to rotate the spins. But the y-axis is easy. So if the spins are going to make transitions, they prefer to do it in the, in the YZ plane. Oh, yeah, so uh, the terms of the field, well, change the direction in the XY plane. Yes, yes, it will change the pathways in, okay. and, and tilt the pathways and change the area those pathways enclose on the sphere. Yes, that's true. So, uh, uh, okay, so the, the oscillation actually, the oscillation actually is, is because the direction of the actual so that's one way to think about it. And the other way to think about it is just to look at the spin Hamiltonian and diagonalize it. It's a, it's a 21 by 21 the Hamiltonian, so you can also get the same information just from the Hamiltonian. But the, this picture is for a large spin. It, it is, this is, you could think, you can think of it as, as, a, as a spin which acquires a phase as it, as it, as it, as it, as it executes dynamics. In the balloon spinning itself is oscillating. Yes, that's right, yes. That's right, the splitting is oscillating um, as a function of transverse field, which, and which is associated with this interference phenomenon. Annie, let me ask you a general question. Where's the field of nanomagnets going? Where's the field of nanomagnets going? Actually, so there's, I, I'd say there, there are two, there's, um, in terms of nanomagnets is actually a huge area of, 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 of uh, physics in the sense that there's, uh, there's, uh, there's, there's physics of all kinds of materials. There's physics of, of, of metals and semiconductors and, and, and so on. And it's also and, and, and these kind of molecules, and it's also coupled very strongly to technology. So 
I mean, I meant we store a lot of information in very small magnets. So it's it's a field where there's both physics and technology, and, and, and one of the I think that's it keeps it vibrant in some sense. Where you know, so there's basic questions about say the how you make a, a stable magnet and make it very very small so you could maximize information storage in terms of oriented, and also how you flip it very fast because you also want to change it. So you have these dual aspects. And it's, it's key. It, it, it makes them feel very lively because discoveries in, in, in physics can translate rapidly into, into technology. I mean, many years this is, is an example of that. So I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a vibrant field. It's bringing together people who do material science it's, and, and, and physics and, and, people, and people in industry. So now, where is it going? I, I, well, my, I, you know, I, I think some of the, the things I've spoken about are areas I think are very exciting. This interaction between spin currents and magnetization, I think, is a very exciting area because you, you can manipulate magnets now with spin currents and you can move very quickly. And it's, and it's, ex and it's exchange interaction. There are many things that are not understood about that. Um, many, much of the statistical statistical physics of having an open system where you're, you know, where you're, where you're, so you're pumping in energy and you're asking how is the, what's, what are the thermal, what are the fluctuations in the system that are just not well understood, and that, that gives room for both theorists and experimentalists to uh, put their heads together to, to, to figure it out. I think in, in terms of this quantum uh, magnetism, there's, there's, there's a, people are interested in, in systems that are large and can exhibit quantum phenomena. So you have to be interested in, say, how large a system can behave quantum mechanically uh, and issues of decoherence. And you think most of this, what I've talked about here is what I call in incoherent tunneling. The system has some dynamics, but the quantum dynamics is really occurring on a very short time scale compared to the time you're, you're, you're measuring it. Um, it's, it's of interest to see on what scales the system actually has real, has evolves coherently. Um, and so you can, you know, very recently people have been doing spin echo experiments on, on these molecules and looking at those time scales. And I think it would be interesting to see what environmental factors are, are, are causing decoherence. And these, these systems are nice in that you really can try to understand the interactions, you can measure many of these interactions, and, and it's an area where chemists can, and physicists can kind of come together to, to try to, you know, to, to engineer systems. Like you might find out that nuclear spins are very important. You could, you, you could tell your chemist friends, could you, can you purify this particular system and, and then look at that kind of uh, system? So I, it's, it's, I think it's a very rich area of, of physics. I mean, there's technology, and there's, there's physics in terms of these very small you know, molecules. I see no more questions then. Thank, okay. thank you, Andy.